Industrial Revolution, that's what we're talking about today. Industrial Revolution. Uh, there's not an exact date on this, but you can say roughly mid, mid 18th century, so we'll say 1750, uh, to like the mid to late 19th century, when the second Industrial Revolution begins, which we'll talk about probably tomorrow slash Wednesday. So we'll just say 1870. We'll just say that. All right. Where, which country uh, primarily starts this, uh, by the way? No, actually, wait. No, we can answer that. So where and what is the Industrial Revolution? And a couple hands go down. Um, Great Britain. Yeah. It's um, replacing human labor with um, mechanization, which is machines. Which nice. OK, it starts in Great Britain. And don't forget from world, we kind of had a little mini tiny Industrial Revolution for steel uh, in China in the Song Dynasty, but not on not on this uh, uh, level. But they're going to borrow a lot of uh, ideas from China and um, India and all that. Starts in Great Britain, and again, what this really is is Industrial Revolution, of course, equals uh, replacing human labor with uh, mechanization. Okay, how does that help? By the way. What does that do exactly? And be as specific as you can as to why you would want people to mechanize this stuff. It, uh, it increases manufacturing, making more products, and also takes away from people working, so businesses can stop focusing on paying their people and can work on making more. Why would they want to focus, stop focusing on paying people? So then they can try to advance what they already have or try to branch out to other companies to try to make more. Mm. How does that, how do they make more by having machines do it? Okay, so they actually make more products, which we'll get into, so you're right. Uh, and this is of course gonna increase the amount of production. So the amount of stuff they can actually make, quantity. But um, uh, what, if you can answer it, why do they not wanna pay for these workers? Because they cost a lot in terms of the, how much money it costs for them. Okay, well, the, wait, the machines are much more expensive than people. But overall, at the end of the day, it also costs more. At, at the end of one day, it's more to pay for a machine. I think you're starting to say in the long term, right? Yes, these are long-term money savers. Uh, and what I would say, so production quality up, and then it's also going to decrease the cost of production in the long term. Why is it important to reduce, re reduce, reduce the uh, cost of production? What does that do? How does that benefit? Well, what benefit does that bring? Cheaper prices for consumers. So? So they spend more on more stuff. Okay, they can buy more things, all right. So it's cheaper for consumers so they can buy more stuff. All right, that's important. And that's one of the, the key components of what economic system or policy or ideas, I'll keep it with you actually if you know it. Laissez-faire? Yeah, laissez-faire capitalism, free market capitalism, uh, according to um, uh, Adam Smith. I almost said Marx, that would have been totally wrong. All right, um, cost production down, production quality up, and that's gonna, of course, um, e increase uh, demand or consumption, as you would say, economically. So basically, just how much stuff people buy. How much they can buy, by the way, right? Um, so Britain's one of the ones that's gonna lead the way, and I wanna talk about why. And I don't think it was in the notes, because we talked about this, maybe it was in the notes, but um, I know it was, we talked about it for AP World. So can anyone give me two reasons why, because there's like six or seven at least, why this starts in Britain and not somewhere else? Because some of these ideas weren't British ideas. They have large coal and iron deposits. Okay, so how does that help? It helps because um, to power these machines with the... To power machines with iron? With coal. With coal, okay. What's the iron used for then? The iron is used for manufacturing machines. Yeah, for the machines themselves. Okay, cool. So we've got the whole why Britain question. Why Great Britain? Uh, that's definitely one. Uh, natural resources they have available. And uh, the most important ones this time are lumber initially, uh, also coal and iron uh, deposits. Cool, so that's one. Give me another one. We'll go you, then you, then you. Um, so. Or give me two, sorry, I asked for two. China and India were, they primarily dominated the manufacturing of textiles, Yeah. for example. And Great Britain wanted to challenge them so they could also produce more so they wouldn't have to pay for imports. So That's more of a result of the Industrial Revolution, not a cause. 
they tried with the putting out system, but it still wasn't a match, so they tried with the uh, mechanization, which ultimately put them in the head. No, no, you're right. You're right, it does. But like I'm saying, why does that start in Britain first as opposed to elsewhere in Europe or in, in China or India? Like, why, why Britain first? And it's not because they're genetically superior, like they're going to think in about 100 years or so. Uh, I think you were next, right? They had a stable financial institution and a high wealth supply. Okay, so they got to uh, increase the money supply. So how does that help uh, industrialization? They have more money to spend on machines, roads, and stuff like that. Um, not quite. In fact, I don't think I can quite give that to you then. Unless you want to take another stab at it. Because that the railroads are later. So like the whole you mentioned textiles, which is where we start. The textile industry is what explodes initially. Still isn't a good way. And then later come the railroads and whatnot. But uh how does this having more uh stable banks and having a higher money supply help stir this on? Because it does. The banks could give out more loans to businesses. There we go. So now and consumers too, by the way. So banks are there to give loans out to business businesses that are starting, whether they're building a factory or later a railroad. Uh, and it also allows consumers to purchase more potentially uh, with big purchases. Nice, that's very important, all right? So these aren't in order, but we'll just put numbers on them. It's not, it's not in order of significance. Um, they have a culture of innovation with um, incentives such as like the Nobel Peace Prize and Chris yeah, okay, Nobel Peace Prize isn't specific to Great Britain, but yeah, that's an example of a reward. Yeah, so they have a culture of innovation that started way back in the scientific revolution, so culture of innovation. So it's actually like uh, a, a good thing in their culture. I don't want to say a cool thing, because it's not cool per se, but it's something people appreciate and admire. Uh, and they, they actually reward people. So they have things like the Crystal Palace exhibition where you can show off and even sell your inventions, because there's no Amazon yet or anything like that. Like people have to physically go and see your stuff. They might be able to see it in an ad in the paper, but that's not more till later in the century. Um, yeah, and then uh, yeah, and then scientific prizes and monetary rewards later, like Nobel Prize. So that's a good example. So prizes and incentives, like the uh, incentives, like the Crystal Palace exhibition, or again, they get to uh, show off all of their inventions and possibly sell them, and then also. Uh, 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 what was the other you said? Nobel Prize. That's not Britain specific, but uh, that's a scientific community thing. Okay, cool. What else we got? Patents. Uh, yeah, what about, I could actually lump several things in with patents, but why do, pat, why do patents matter? Uh, they like protect your own intellectual property. So like if you invent something, someone else can't, like, can't just come in and take that and claim it as their own. Right, they problem. could, but you could, you could sue them and there'd be a whole bunch of liability attached to that. Cool. Um, yeah, so legal patents. Oh, by the way, who's the one enforcing the patent? This is really important. The government. The government, right. So you would say state enforced, we're actually going to list a couple of these things. State enforced, number one, patents. All right, that makes people much more likely to share their ideas because they're not afraid of them being stolen. Okay, cool. Uh, what else is state enforced that encourages people to go out and start businesses and make things because it's less risky for them? Corporations. Yeah, yeah. corporations. Those are a relatively new entity, and they're, uh, they're not solely in Great Britain, but they are uh, um, a common practice in Britain. What else do they have that allows you, whether you're a corporation or you've put out a patent, to reap the benefits yourself, and the state actually protects this, so that um, your, your extra effort, your innovation, whatever it might be, actually gets you the benefit, which encourages you to do it. Private property. private property protected, exactly. Right, and that goes back further in um, uh, uh, English history, but you could cite the Magna Carta or even parts of the Glorious Revolution, the protection of, of uh, under the English Bill of Rights um, as, as markers of that. All right, that's very important, actually, because this actually encourages this and, well, two, three, and four all encourage people to go do it uh, because they have money and they get loans safely. They uh, are rewarded for them, either culturally or, or monetarily. And then, of course, they're safe in doing so because only they can reap the benefits and their, their assets are safe if something goes wrong if they have a corporation. Cool. What else we got? Those were great answers, by the way. Uh, Guilds and tariffs are now gone, so people can uh, really work on their Okay. Own that, that's a little later, though, but you're right. That, that, I'm not going to say it's a cause of the Industrial Revolution because that's those sort of... Although they did start getting rid of guilds pretty early. 
Fair enough. We'll put that up there. Uh, I would say laissez-faire policies like free trade, uh, rural guilds. That's going to start earlier in England than anywhere else, especially the free trade thing. They're super pro-free trade. But again, laissez-faire ain't perfect, and we'll talk about why. Uh, Parliament and uh, gentry trying to protect what the rights they have. Yeah, that's all right. Fair enough. Uh, that kind of goes to the state and force, but they're uh, they're pro. I put that right here actually. Uh, pro laissez-faire government, and again, uh, House of Commons and even some of the nobility, they have a stake in this, so they want to encourage uh, commercialization uh, in private industry. So Parliament uh, supported free market practices because again, they are. Uh, they essentially are the ones that own the factories and mines and railroads later on. Uh, so of course they want to enhance their own ability to, to grow and profit. All right, that's a good enough set, I think. I think the one thing we forgot, by the way, was uh, number six. This goes a little bit earlier. This kind of contributes to the money supply and resources. Uh, because they were on the Atlantic and they were cut off from India, the Indian, the Indian Ocean Trade Network in China, uh, they went out to try to find another route along the Portuguese and Spanish, and they were able to, once the Portuguese and Spanish found it, take that route and also claim some land in um, the Americas. So they have colonies in the Americas, and now at this point they're starting to take um, uh, territory in the Indian Ocean and Africa from the Portuguese uh, along with the Dutch. So I would say uh, Atlantic location. So they're forced to, of course, connect with the Indian Ocean trade network in China. And in doing so, they're going to either take colonies from other Europeans or claim and slash take it from uh, American Indians. All right, so, and then colonies. All right, cool. Those are some uh, great reasons. All right, so textiles are the first to really, uh, I don't want to say explode, but take off, uh, become very successful. Uh, so I want to know why textiles and how, if you can, and also what textiles are. What are textiles? Uh, um, textiles are clothing. Are clothing, uh, clothing linens, yeah. Yeah, clothing, linens, and such. And the reason why it started off in Great Britain is because they had the inventions and um, like the spinning jenny and water frame. Nice. Okay. Textiles the first to take off, and again, that's any 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 cloth made manufactured goods. Right. Linens, blankets, uh, clothes, things like that. It used to be really expensive to make these things, and then they started coming up with some ways and inventions to make them much more efficiently. So you mentioned some specifics, but can anybody tell me why it would be so difficult to compete with India or China or other places as far as making these textiles? Because they would just lose out. What you got? Because uh, they have large populations. Okay, that's true. They do have large populations, so there's a greater supply of workers and you probably have a lower cost of production. That's true. But uh, tell me about the process. Like, why couldn't they do it better before the Industrial Revolution than China or India. At best, they could probably do it as good. Do you know why that is? Okay. Because Britain had the putting off system. Okay, but uh, that's not necessarily an advantage. I'm not exactly sure how... You know what, they didn't commercialize it in India or China, so that might have been an advantage, actually. I'm not aware of it, but logically, it seems like it would be. If I'm encouraged to make things, to make my own money for them, I'm more likely to do it than I'm just a random peasant making my own clothes. So maybe, I'll say maybe. Um, let me rephrase the question though, because I think I asked it in, improperly. Um, what about industrialization gave them the advantage? You mentioned some specific machines, but why do these machines all of a sudden mean I make it better than India and China and all the others that have traditionally done it. There's less human error when machines are being used. Okay, fair enough. All right, so they have less human error. What else? I'll give you that, by the way. What else they got? They never get tired. Yeah, machines don't get tired. They might break down. But even if they break down, you can probably fix them. If a person breaks down, they got to heal and you know, replace them. And then, of course, that's a human life that maybe is harmed. So that's, that's another element of, 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 of negativity. The efficiency. The efficiency? Yeah, okay, cool. So all of those are, are, are valid answers, I would say. 
Uh, so they're going to be largely, this is the, one of the first industries that's large scale replaced by machines. You mentioned a couple of specific ones, which I should, by the way, give you money for, because that was good. Water frame and spinning jenny are a couple in the late 18th century, mid to late 18th century. Frame, spinning jenny. And we don't have to get specific on exactly what they did, but basically what they did was they made it take far less people to produce one like unit of cloth. All right, so like for example, uh, I can't remember the exact number, I always forget, but I believe uh, these machines could make a worker 10 to 20 times more efficient, meaning instead of one lady making 10 things of cloth a day, one lady could make uh, 100 to 200 things of cloth a day, which is a huge, huge, huge improvement. All right, so now I, now I can hire less people in the first place and I can produce more. So it's much cheaper for me uh, to produce. So when I would make cloth before, the process was something like this. I get the wool, right? Wool comes in from somewhere. Uh, I gotta pay for that, right? Unless I'm also the shepherd, which I'm probably not. So I gotta pay for that, all right? And then it goes to somebody who threads it. So they gotta pull this wool apart and then spin it into thread, which takes a long time, all right? So they gotta spin it into thread. Um, then that person, maybe they're also the person that does the next step, but probably not. Then they take that thread and then it gets woven by somebody else into the actual like item, like whether it's a blanket or, or clothes. And then uh, that probably has to be uh, bleached or dyed as well. And that's probably also not done by the same person. Dyed, maybe it's Spell die, D-Y-E-D-I-E-D? D-Y-E-D? I -E -D? D -Y -E -D? I don't know if I've ever seen that, but if that's wrong, oh well, I don't care. Uh, bleach or dyed, and then you could uh, go and sell it. Uh, what's wrong with this process here? It has to go through multiple people, and it costs uh, a lot more. Yeah, okay, <clears throat> so it's gotta go through multiple people, so it costs a lot more, but also what else about this process? It takes a long time. It's got to go all, all these different steps and people, which I think you kind of mentioned anyway. So it's much more expensive. I have to pay each person along the way, uh, and I have to wait for that process to be completed. Uh, and it could take a very long time, but they're going to, starting with this textile industry, find a much more efficient way of doing it. So first of all, of course, uh, these water frames and spinning jennies are able to thread and or weave these things at once way better than a single person. So that alone, boom. Uh, reduces my cost of production by a lot uh, and time. What else reduces the time besides the mechanization? Because these are examples of mechanization. But industrialization isn't just mechanization, although that's a good chunk of it. What else uh, are we forgetting here that really improves it? Transportation. Transportation, yes, but we're getting there. That's more railroad related. Uh, that's a little bit after it started. I'm sticking with the textiles here. Having all the workers in one area so them travel work. Okay, what's that called? Oh my goodness, I, I'm still gonna, no, you gotta remember that one, that's too easy. Organization. Nope, that's the process of people going to the cities. Factory system, yes. Uh, so this makes it a lot cheaper, right? So now it's cheaper and I'm making more. Uh, and, I, and I do cut down on time, but then I additionally cut down on, down on time and costs. So I don't have to pay for transportation, I don't have to wait for it to go from station to station. It's all done in one spot uh, with the factory system. All right, and that's the idea that you took all of those steps of production, the uh, threading, the, uh, sorry, the spinning, the weaving, the bleaching and dyeing are all done in the same location and then put out, uh, then it's sent to the store for, for sale or, or market or whatever. So that saves a lot of time and money on the travel and uh, the moving from station to station, but also uh, it makes it so that I can use workers to do the same task over and over and over. So I've got these ladies running whatever um, uh, machine that they're running, uh, or feeding the cloth, or bleaching or dyeing or whatever. By the way, they oftentimes they use the urine back then, which is super gross. I wouldn't want to be in that department. Uh, but what's it called when somebody's doing the same job over and over and over? And instead of me paying them per product, I actually pay them for their time, like per hour. I mean, what that's called? Clearly it wasn't in the notes, but take a stab at it. Wage worker? Yeah, that's, it. that's really what it's called. So uh, specialized labor and or, uh, well, it's, com it's combined. So they're specialized because they're doing the same task over and over, but it's wage-based labor, right? I get however many, in this case, would be cents per hour uh, for my time worked. All right, so this, this is going to do a couple things. So first of all, I have specialized workers that get really good at what they're doing. 
And then of course I am paid, not for my product, like you know, per one I make or whatever, I'm actually paid for my time. Uh, so uh, time is the uh, unit of value. And to make that much more simple, we would just say wage workers. That's a new concept, uh, is wage working. Okay, um, if I'm paying people per hour though, what am I going to have to do? They now have to develop centerized time. Not yet, that's the railroads. Good guess though. I asked that question intentionally because I need to get that answer. Somebody would. What? You have to set working hours. You do have to set working hours. So you have to kind of invent a clock, which didn't really necessarily exist before, at least not on a large scale. Um, and you had to uh, organize when workers started and when workers finished work. All right, so let's, let's go over that for a second. So first of all, you do have to uh, uh, formulate set times and shifts. I think I told you this, maybe I told this in my econ class, because we do an economic history perspective of it, which is working really well, by the way. Um, how would I wake up in time? It always used to be the sun, but the sun is, it varies across the year. I always, if I always had to be at my job at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. or whatever it is, how can I, uh, how can I do that? It's the most annoying thing you've ever heard of, by the way. Yes, those are the people that go around and literally wake you up. Uh, they're the ones that go out and knock on your door or your window or whatever. And they're the ones that like remind you or force you to go to work. And if you don't, you get fined, punished, et cetera, or whatever. So that sounds like the most annoying thing in the world to me. Uh, but you know, that's what they had to work, live with. Uh, so they didn't have alarm clocks. So they literally, companies would hire people to go wake you up uh, at a specific time. And if you didn't get up in time, they would like pound on your door and all that stuff. All right, so uh, you had, what was the word I'm looking for? I actually skipped one part on accident. How, how, would, uh, how would these these people that wake you up know where you live? Tenement housing. Yeah, okay, so you got tenement housing, absolutely, but uh, you also have, and this is in the notes, I don't think, you have actually what are called company towns, which is a gross concept. It's where you are not just paid by your uh, um, company, your, your employer, but they actually provide your housing for you, and obviously it's not gonna be good housing, uh, whether it's tenement houses or just you know crappy houses they put up at low cost. So they know exactly where you live. So you're in a company town that knows exactly where you are at, at all times and can go up and you know wake you up if you're not there or, or up on time or whatever. So you have company house, company towns. And again, these ain't made for luxury. This is made as cheaply as it can to just put you in a place you don't die of freezing overnight and then you can work the next day. Company towns, tenement houses or apartments. What are these uh, tenements uh, like exactly? Like, I mean, um, they have a negative connotation to them for a reason, and why is that? Somebody tell me something about them. They're run down. Okay, but a regular house could be run down, but this is characteristic of nearly all tenement houses. It's basically like 10 people living in one room. Yeah, okay, so you have a large family because there's no birth control, so there's that. Unless you have the guts to, you know, practice infanticide, you're just going to keep having kids. Uh, so... You got a lot of large families, and they're usually the like minimum space, so it's usually one room, um, maybe two if you're lucky. But it's small. You're crammed with a lot of people, and here's the best part: no indoor plumbing. What does that mean? You got to do your business outside. You got to do your business outside. Exactly right. So uh, they often had basically just what are. I mean, you guys probably know if you go to like a concert or something. They have those portable bathrooms, like the plastic things or whatever. Those would be, yeah, porta potty. That, those would be like the most luxurious thing you've ever seen uh, compared to these. Yeah, you basically get a, you basically get like, not a cardboard box, but you basically have like a, a small room with a tiny door and then a hole that everyone in the same tenement house uses. So there's a lot of people all in there. You have to go outside to share these, you know, very few um, uh, outhouses essentially is what they are. So if that sounds enjoyable to you, then I don't, I don't, I, it just doesn't. So most people would just go to the bathroom in their own apartments and in a pail and just throw it out the window. So you can imagine how fun that was to walk down the street. Um, the, all those, if you ever look back at old pictures of like Victorian England and all that, the 19th century, and they're walking around with umbrellas, it ain't because they're keeping the sun out. It's because they're, well, it's partly that, but it's mostly because they don't want to have like human feces rain down on them as they're walking in the streets. Um, so that was a common uh, practice. They called them something buckets. I can't remember what they called them. 
It's not poop buckets. <laughs> it's something. Yeah, I can't remember, but yeah, they would they would generally give you old uh, a nice warning, but uh, if, if they didn't like you, I guess they might not. But anyways, so you got that to deal with, and this was, by the way, a what you would call the plight of this new labor class, um, known as the working class. Yes, uh, and that's just one of the things. So the working class had some abysmal conditions. And this is a new class of people, by the way. A lot of these were former peasants that had been kicked off of the land due to the enclosure movement or just the fact that they could do better uh, financially working these factories. Not that it was wonderful by any means. Uh, but they had some pretty nasty conditions. This is the urban laborers. Well, not even urban. You could work in a mine uh, or something like that. So I'm just going to say manual laborers. No, I'm going to say factory and manual laborers. That's what I'm going to say. Okay, uh, so here's one negative part as their uh, living conditions suck. What are some, uh, give me two other things that they uh, have to endure. Um, they work six days a week for 10 hours. Yeah, no, 10 hours is a lower amount. That they oh. reduced it to that. It, usually, it started out with 12 to 14 hour days. Yeah, okay, so six day work weeks, not G day work weeks, that's not a thing. Six day weeks. And before, they regulated it 12 to 14 hour days. And if you didn't, then you didn't get paid or you got kicked out of your house because the company owned the house or you couldn't pay for the house. So you kind of had to, unfortunately. So that sucks. What else? Uh, they had no child protections and the government um, banned them from unionizing. Nice. Okay, good. I was actually going to get into that a little later, but you're right. That's a big part of it. So uh, they are going to, uh, what would you say before the banning anything? Um, no child protection. What do you mean by no job protection? Like if you get you injured, technically don't have job protection now either. Well, if you get injured, you're injured. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So, uh, uh, all right, cool. So, how can we phrase this? You have no uh, health protection, liability protection. Yeah, if you get injured, you're just injured. Okay, cool. So we'll, we'll just say dangerous work conditions, no protection. Dangerous conditions, <laughs> slash no protection. And again, to be specific, by protection, we mean the company's not liable for paying for your health insurance or wages while you're out of work and things like that, so you're just kind of out. All right, uh, what else? Two more. There was no age restriction, which increased the risk of injury for the children and others. Yeah, child labor is a big one. You got another one, too? Nope. Well, you did kind of explain it, though, in two ways. So we're not only afraid of the children hurting themselves and dying, but they could actually harm others, too, by just being kids. Uh, have a kid working in a mine, screws up, uh, he might not just kill or hurt himself. He could bring down the whole mine and kill everybody in it, uh, which has happened before. So, um, yeah, child labor is a very, very, uh, it's a major issue. All right. Um, there's one other one that we haven't really talked about. Poor wages. Yeah, terrible wages. So poor wages. And uh, like um, Andre already said, right? Didn't you say? What? Didn't you already say the union thing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, poor wages. No, I say low wages. Low wages. And no unions or strikes. And it's not that they didn't think of it. It's that it was often either illegal or it wasn't illegal for a company to stop it violently. All right. So let's talk about why that is then. Oh, let me get you guys all paid here. Got you for that one. Who said the child, that was use of the child labor thing. All right. Yes, you bring up an excellent point. So let's go to the uh, next new class. So again, they kind of were the, what were the peasants before? And now we kind of almost have a new nobility. Not that they have like these born in privileges or anything, but they're definitely the new rich and powerful class. Oftentimes more rich and powerful than the nobility, even though the nobles in Europe largely still had more privileges in them, in the, at least in the 1700s, and less so in the 1800s. Uh, this new middle class is what they're called, because they're beneath, between the nobility and the working class slash peasantry. Um, give me some characteristics of these guys and girls. Um, who were they? What did they what, yeah, who were they, basically? They were factory owners, bankers, um, like that, that lived, lived, uh, lavishly or yeah, so the non-noble, the non, the wealthy non-nobility, wealthy, oops, 
non-nobility. And yes, they're, uh, they're often very, very wealthy. And what did you say exactly? Oh, you gave a couple examples. Uh, factory owners, bankers. So these are some example professions. Factory owners, bankers, landowners, mine owners, later on railroad owners. All of those are gonna be the highly, highly, highly wealthy middle class. So I don't mean middle class as in, I have a three bedroom house and a family and two or three cars. That's like today's idea of middle class. Uh, this would be like the super, super mega rich, like again, Elon Musk, you know what? What? Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, yeah, exactly. I thought you kept, I kept thinking you said something about pesos. It's like, yeah. it'd be a lot of pesos, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jeff Bezos. I don't even know how many pesos he, he technically is worth. He's worth billions. Heck, his wife took half of it, and he's still like one of the richest people in the entire world. So anyways, um, yeah, the wealthy non-nobility. How about, um, what's up with this no union strikes thing, no worker protection thing? Because it has to do with these guys. So uh, look, just to reiterate, no, let's not reiterate. Why? First, tell me why. It's hard for these workers, or not illegal, for them to unionize, strike, which is how they would negotiate for wages in the first place. And again, if you forgot what that was, it's where <clears throat> you all would stop working, and that would force your uh, uh, employer to at least negotiate for better work, eight wages and conditions. Because if you're not working, he's not making any money. So the middle class were the factory owners, so they were the ones that were oppressing the working class. And when they tried to intervene by doing strikes or unions, <clears throat> the government would send in troops to stop them. From doing yeah, yeah, but why? You're right. But why is that? Why does the government come in on the side of businesses in the middle class? That's what I'm asking specifically. All right, why? Factory on the strike for government officials. That's part of it? Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, these guys were often, um, and I, I will say this first. So first of all, the government often sided with business, big business, or uh, didn't punish big business. Uh, or violently ending strikes and unions. I can't think of any specific ones off the top of my head in Europe, but in the United States, for example, you had the Pullman strike and you had the Homestead strike where strikers tried to, you know, um, well, go on strike technically, and unionized to try to earn better wages in the steel industry and in the railroad business, and sometimes it got a little out of hand. But uh, either, in the case of the Homestead Act, or the Homestead Act, in the case of the uh, uh, Homestead uh, Steel strike, the company hired people to go rough up and eventually kill several of the union workers, and then instead of punishing the company, they actually forced, the state forced the workers to go back to work. This is in Pennsylvania. And then uh, the Pullman strike, is that in South Dakota? Whatever it was, wherever it ended up being. Uh, a bunch of railroad workers went on strike and the government uh, wanting to keep the wheels of capitalism turning and, and saying that by going on a railroad strike they were stopping the Federal Post Service, they actually sent the army in to force those workers back to work as well. And again, those are US examples, but it's the same idea uh, over in uh, Europe as well. So then my question, so that's, what you, that's the answer you gave and it is correct. Why though is the government siding with big business or ignoring what they're doing? And you gave me one right already. Okay, so that's the bribery. We call that cronyism or lobbying today. Cronyism, where big business is, is paying for laws and policies that favor themselves and they can afford it, fair enough. Uh, to collect tax money? Well, they didn't want to collect much tax money. That was one of the points. They wanted to, um, like, the economy to move smoothly, so they like, wanted to get richer opposed to who? Um, the middle class and government. Yeah, they're in the government, right? So you're, you're totally right. So they wanted to uh, uh, promote economic growth and keep down the cost of production. And if you got to pay these guys more, or, or pay for their accidents, or give them health care or whatever, that all costs more money for you as an employer and raise prices. So they want to keep the cost of production low and keep the cogs of capitalism turning. Uh, and most importantly, like you already said, the middle class either has the government in their pocket, they bribe them, or they are in the government themselves. Right? So the middle class either uh, buys or 
is a part of, I would say constitutes, that's the technical word I'm looking for, makes up, constitutes uh, the government. So these are the guys that are congressmen and uh, uh, mayors maybe, or governors, or uh, senators, house members, parliament members, whoever they might be. Why is it that there are more of these guys in the government than workers? Because there was a former century plus, so they're already in office because of how much wealth they have. You're right, but like, well, why don't I have regular working class people in there? Because it's, it's just for anyone who's non-noble, technically. Because that'll make enough to be considered a middle class. Not quite. Good guess, though. The um, working class didn't have like uh, voting rights because they didn't own like any Yep. Property. So sometimes they didn't have voting rights at all, which we'll get to uh, probably next week with classical liberalism and, and uh, um, the charter movement and all that. But yeah, so working class people, a lot of times, especially early on in the Industrial Revolution, couldn't vote in the first place. So they couldn't run for office or vote anybody that they liked in because they had no vote at all. All right, so one of the reasons why no working class votes or participation, but even if they did, let's say that they could. I can participate as a working class person. Why weren't there a lot of working class people in parliament themselves or Congress? Because the government could have taxed as much as the rich middle class. Did you say taxes? Tax them as much. No, that's not exactly why. Flat tax rates can work. Progressive tax rates are generally better uh, for the social safety net, but the reason is this. Initially, they don't pay you a salary for being in parliament or Congress. So which of these two groups can afford to not work for a while and go to the Capitol in London or the Capitol in DC and debate and vote on things and which one cannot? Middle yeah, the middle class, well I said it gives both. Middle class can afford to do that and the working class people can't. Like giving up a month or two of wages to go like, you know, to London, first of all, just to pay to go there uh, and then stay there somehow and somehow survive, afford a place to stay and eat and then have your family not also starve and be kicked out of their place. It wasn't a possibility. Uh, so before they had salaries for these government members, uh, they just weren't even a part of it. So of course you're not gonna have any laws that help these guys out because they either can't vote for people that like them or uh, there's no salaries for government, uh, for, for parliament or Congress. So they can't afford to. So it's just all middle class people or nobles and they ain't gonna help them out because they're the ones that want the uh, uh, wages and all that to stay low. All right, so after that, we'll take our break, and then after that, we'll talk more about um, the dynamics of the two classes. All right, uh, oh, real quickly, family, by the way. The way family dynamics change, peasants all used to uh, work together, performing complementary tasks. I think you guys, we talked about before, like, you know, maybe the guy does the plow, and then the younger uh, person or the women or whatever do the, the less physical strength intensive things. Not that they can't do any, but like, you know, they would do the planting or weeding or whatever. It's, it's tasks that help each other out, complement with an E, not an I. Not saying, he did a great job. Like, it's, you know, they go help each other out. So they worked together all day and they would, you know, relax and whatnot when the sun went down and they kind of spent the whole day together. And even when they would celebrate, have those religious festivals and all that, they were all together the whole time, essentially. That's going to change here for both classes, actually. So how do the dynamics of the middle class family go uh, compared to this all working together, all with each other, all the time, with the peasant families and whatnot. The whole family work. In the middle class? No, it was actually a sign of status to not have the whole family work. How does the middle working class? About working class though, like the oh, that's fine. We'll do working class first. How's the working class family look now? So the father, the mother, and all the children would work until the the age acts. They, but they, but they kind of did that in peasant uh, life anyway. They all worked together for most of the day. What's the difference? The long hour times and how busy the beginning work compared to Potentially. Not quite it though. They all worked like at different like, locations? Yeah, they were split up, right? So they wouldn't be doing, they were doing complementary tasks, but away from one another. Different breaks if they had any. Uh, they weren't in the same room, so it, it left families feeling a lot more distant. So uh, they still had the long work hours, but the key thing here was they were separate. Separated, that's not even a word. Separated. Like separated is, but the word I wrote was just scribble. Uh, they were separated. Uh, that's part of the factory system. You know, they're not in the same room, they don't see each other interact much, and they don't really get to share as much of a bond. Then they go home at night, and then they're exhausted, they just sleep. There's little to no interaction, unless it's maybe a Sunday, and then you're going to church, and you know, that's just how it is back then. What else we got about this family here? I was gonna say about the middle class. 
Okay, now we're talking middle class. What's it called? The families, uh, like the mothers and children did not work because it was a sign of both. Yep, so uh, father uh, worked, and it was actually a sign of status to not have the rest of the family work. If you were working, if you were working as a mother, that meant you weren't able to afford to not work, so it was a sign of status to have that. So uh, mother slash children at home. But it's not like the uh, women and children weren't doing anything. What were they doing at home? The mother was raising children. Yeah, but a little more specific than that. Uh, like educating them and uh, teaching them household chores. Exactly. They were they were responsible for educating. So the mother is educated. Right. So they would. Uh, were, was there public schools back then? No. no. In most places, there was not. There, they kind of started them a little bit in Prussia, and they flirted with them and. In, in Austria before the reforms were repealed and all that. But for the most part, there wasn't a public school system. So if I was educated, I either had to be middle class to afford a tutor or have my mother do it. If I was working class, I just didn't get educated at all. Uh, later on, they're gonna have a thing called the Sunday School Movement where they would like, these middle class women would go teach working class kids like how to read and stuff on Sundays. So Sunday School literally was Sunday School. Uh, it wasn't like what it is now. It's basically just like kids hang out and do things Whatever. Um, so uh, that's family. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good uh, definition for that. So fathers work again. That's a sign of status to not have the mother and kids work, uh, and the mothers would of course educate, raise the kids, while the father did his business stuff, whatever it was. Okay. Uh, back to the working class. Long hours separated. What else is different about the family dynamic, as far as teenagers? What was different about these teenagers as opposed to before? It's in there. All right, if, uh, if I'm raised with my family and I'm always with them and I feel connected, am I gonna leave the family house sooner or later? Later, because I'm more connected. So if I'm separated constantly and, and stressed out and exhausted all the time, am I gonna feel connected and wanna stay with my family at that position? No, I'm going to want my own room or whatever instead of our one common room where eight people are in. So uh, you had adolescents were much like, more likely to leave left earlier. And also, <clears throat> also to try to numb themselves from the stress, pain, and difficulty of this working class life, something became far more common uh, in the Industrial Revolution for this working class. Yeah, alcoholism, right. And alcohol, this is uh, this may be psych stuff for you. The reason why people are alcoholics generally is you can have a genetic predisposition to enjoy it, get like dopamine hits and feel good from it. But most people do it to uh, make themselves not care about things that stress them out. So if they're exhausted or stressed or having anxiety, uh, the alcohol makes you not care about the consequences. So you realize that there's still problems, whatever it is, like your marriage or your job or, or whatever but you just don't care. So it kind of alleviates that anxiety, which is why the Soviet Union was so drunk all the time uh, during the Cold War, because their lives were terrible, and so they had their, their vodka consumption was just astronomical. Uh, and it wasn't because they're like, mmm, vodka's delicious, it's because uh, they were just trying to numb themselves and cope, essentially. Uh, but that becomes much more common in uh, working class households. And if you're exhausted and stressed and frustrated, not connected with your family and possibly drinking, uh, you also have an increase in uh, domestic violence. Yep, towards uh, children or wives, but uh, it, it can go both ways, certainly. But yeah, uh, that's gonna be an, an increase as well, which is an issue we'll talk about probably tomorrow and Wednesday about how they try to reform things to make this situation not so bleak, but they do so incorrectly. Uh, they basically just try to ban alcohol, and, and they find that that doesn't work. But anyways, um, that's family. Okay, so that's Britain. That's some new classes, and that is um, how the family dynamics are. Let's now quickly talk about uh, what Britain's going to start doing with all of this extra money it's getting in its economy, and uh, why. The next thing to be revolutionized is power. So powering these machines, uh, initially it's human driven or it's, you know, uh, they use wind power maybe, or uh, they use like a mill, I'll run along the river, it spins the wheel which can turn things, it's basically free power, it's pretty much just gravity. You're just paying for 
water that's rushing down. Uh, so they initially have human, water, and wind power to power some of these machines. But it's not that efficient. Uh, what's the next thing in the first Industrial Revolution that's going to really uh, change the way machines operate and transportation works? Uh, I'm not quite sure who was next, but you are going to get it. The invention of James Watt's steam engine. OK. Uh, it was powered by coal and steam, which created a vacuum inside a chamber, and it looped on to basically like an engine. Yeah, absolutely. And it would push a, push a piston, essentially, that, yeah. could, that could move things or not. Yeah, we won't get into how it works exactly. Basically, I'll just briefly tell you. Uh, they use the coal to heat up water, which creates steam. And they cool the steam off, which, of course, the, the increase in pressure and decrease, decrease in pressure, increase from the steam, decrease in the cooling off, is able to push and move this turbine, a uh, uh, piston, which could turn a turbine, or the first thing it was used for is just to, to pump water out of these mines so they could go in and get more coal and iron and things like that. Uh, so yeah, uh, James Watt's steam engine. Uh, it's actually technically invented by somebody else, but he refined it. Uh, James Watt's and the steam engine are gonna revolutionize uh, power. So first they use it as, of course, powered by coal, not lumber. Um, it, it requires a lot more heat over time to, to manage, so coal is a good one for that. Uh, and that's going to first pump mines and allow them to uh, gain access to a lot more coal, pump mines and other minerals, uh, but also it's going to drive what eventually, uh, well, you tell me. Okay. Yeah, so um, why do railroads make this industrial revolution, why do they accelerate the growth of this industrial revolution? It allows for cheaper passenger transport. Absolutely. So it's going to help companies that are moving coal or textiles or whatever good, or people even, whatever goods going from place to place, they make it so you can transport way more, way quicker, and much cheaper. All right. So this is, of course, going to power the railroad explosion. Increase. Revolution. There we go. I keep, I keep using the word explosion, but I don't like that because, I mean, there were explosions, but not the kind we're talking about. So uh, railroads, they're going to revolutionize transportation, which again makes it quicker to go places, which is fantastic. Uh, but it's also cheaper because you can carry way, way, way more. So if I wanted to carry a bunch of steel or coal or people or textiles, whatever it is, it would take a lot of time and money to put it all onto a ship and have it sail up a river, hopefully, uh, or to another location, or to travel over land on carts. That'd take a long time to do. And some things were too heavy, you couldn't even do that. It'd have to be by a big ship, uh, so it could only be around the shores uh, or ports. With railroads, though, it can be anywhere, as long as you connect the, the railroads. So here's what people don't understand. Uh, most of these railroads, although the land might have been given to them cheaply by the government, were not built by the government. Who's building most of these in Great Britain, the United States, and uh, well, pr pretty much those two are the most privatized. Private companies? Yeah, private companies. Well, I just gave you the answer, yeah. But you knew it anyway. <clears throat> so these are gonna be a railroad revolution, and it's gonna be driven mostly by private railroad companies. How do railroad companies make money then? Company the people that use the railroads? Yeah, they charge people to use the railroads, essentially. So they are the ones that take the loans to lay down the uh, railroad tracks after they get the land, either by free or cheaply from the government. Um, which of course they're a part of, so they make sure they get the land cheap, cheaply and or freely. Um, they lay the, the track, they pay for the railroads, and then the other companies are gonna of course pay to do the shipping, and they charge them whatever, a profitable amount. They make money doing that, and then they extend the railroad to another town, or add another one. They just keep networking slowly across the entirety of Great Britain. So I think I have a picture in the, the slides of like, railroads in like 1800, it's like none, and then like, 10 years later, all, or like 20 years later, there's a bunch, and then by 1851, it's like a, there's a spider web all over the southern part of Great Britain uh, because of this phenomenon. So they're gonna connect cities like Liverpool and Manchester and London uh, that produce or, or like raw materials like coal or iron, uh, and then of course manufacture them. And that's going to make a cheap, quick, uh, efficient network. And again, railroad companies, get the land cheaply or for free from the government. 
they borrow money from banks to lay the, tra lay the tracks. Companies pay because it's much better for them to pay for this transportation. Uh, and then, of course, that makes the railroads richer, and then they just keep expanding it. Pretty soon, uh, Great Britain and later the United States and then later Germany are just covered in railroad tracks, which is good for them uh, for many reasons. For the United States, it's good during the Civil War because the North had the railroads and the South didn't, basically. So we got to move stuff a lot better and cheaper and quickly than they did. Uh, Germany is going to be able to whoop on France because they've got a better railroad system, and Great Britain just keeps being Great Britain because they're on an island and no one can get to them because they have too many ships. All right. Um, so that's the railroad revolution and explosion. Uh, so it's first going to start in uh, Great Britain, obviously, and then it's going to also expand into Germany. We'll talk about how in a second. Uh, and not the AP Euro, this is more AP World, but uh, United States follows suit about the same time as Germany. So uh, I don't put France up there. How come I don't have France in there? They focus more on else. Yeah, uh, and there's a good reason for that too, by the way. So what I'm going to do now is going to talk about non-Great Britain countries in Europe, in this case, specifically Germany, France, and then just going to lump Southern and Eastern Europe together here. Uh, so Germany is going to uh, industrialize quickly. France is going to industrialize slowly. I'll just put a flat mark there. Yeah. And then Eastern and Southern Europe are going to industrialize. Not at all. Actually, I should do like that. Slow. But that means like a lot. A little. No, yeah, that works. Fast, slow, not at all. Okay. Germany. Fast. Why? They're not even a country yet. They're not even a country in 1871. They're a bunch of little German states. But why are they able to do this so quickly compared to the, uh, uh, the French who don't really get to take off at all? They, had, they actually had coal and iron deposits. Okay, cool. So natural resources they have available. So they have some coal and iron deposits. Coal and iron. There's another non-resource uh, uh, reason, though, but you're, but you're correct. Um, they have trade agreements between German states. They do. They have a lot of free trade agreements between German states. Do you remember the name of that major uh, group that for a trade union where there's no tariffs in between them? It's like Zolferine. Zolferine, yeah. Zolferine. I think it's in the 1830s it was started. Don't quote me, though. 34, maybe? Let's say 1830s. Uh, that's basically a free trade organization. So a bunch of German states would have no or reduced tariffs between each other. They had companies uh, lay railroad tracks uh, between states, so it made it really easy for the Germans to work together cheaply. And then when they go to war with the French, with the Prussians, uh, they're going to do well because of that, and then they'll just form Germany pretty easily. Was there another one for Germany? Is there another example I, I gave them? Is there another German one? I can't remember. What? Stable banks. Stable banks. Yeah, they do have more stabilized uh, financial system. Stable financial system. There's a whole class called the Junkers, by the way, that, that have a lot of banks tied to them. Uh, we won't get into that, though. Well done. Um, France, though, a little sad. Not, not, not so quick to industrialize. Why? Uh, they did have Anglo-French free trade, but they... Yeah, so they do have some positives. They do have free trade with England, which is helpful to them. Uh, Anglo-French uh, 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 free trade policy or agreement. That was in 1860. It's a little later. But yeah, that, that's going to help them out as far as getting raw materials. So they're not doing nothing. But uh, why aren't they doing as well? Because they want a stable banking system. Okay, yeah. They don't have uh, as much commercialization because of a, uh, an unstable banking system. So I'm going to say not just the banks, but... They're still largely using that system that taxes people a lot to give money to the state. I forget what that was called. It's done by, started by uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Okay, that's the, the people that organize it, but uh, it's like they're still using basically uh, mercantile practices. Mercantile practices, which pretty much just means a lack of commercialization. So yeah. They don't have as many wealthy banks. The taxes are high there. It's not as easy to engage in a, a commerce in France. They don't have a, a lot of natural resources. Yep, they lack the uh, they lack coal and iron deposits. So they have to buy it from other people, and other people aren't really selling right now because they're using it themselves. The Germans are using it themselves. The Scandinavians later use it themselves. Uh, the British use themselves. Americans use themselves. <coughs> the Russians later use themselves. They're not really selling out that much to other countries, so it's hard to get by. So they try to focus on canals instead of railroads, but that doesn't work out well for them. And the worship of a sad face person doesn't work out. Okay, uh, pretty couple 
simple explanations for Eastern and Southern Europe though, as to why they don't industrialize pretty much at all. Russia kind of tries to force itself, but it, it doesn't work out too well. Resources. All right, they lack the resources, but that's not the only reason why I lack resources. So yeah, they don't have much coal, iron, or uh, access. What else? Uh, lack a stable financial. Okay, they lack the commercialization because they are they don't even mercantilist. By the way, they're like a a a, a step down. Um, they still have like more feudalism. And yeah, they're like feudal agricultural economy still. So they lack uh, commercialization. And they are still largely feudal. Yeah, so if mercantilism is a step down from capitalism, then feudalism is a step down from mercantilism. They are way down the, the ladder of uh, uh, efficiency as far as industrialization goes. So yeah, uh, remember those key components, especially these specific examples like the Zilfrein trade agreement, and then of course uh, how mercantilist practices in France and feudalism in Eastern and Southern Europe make it hard to, uh, uh, well, have private property or, or get loans or you know have legal patents so people aren't they don't have low prices and people have no incentive or protection for uh for, for going out on their own so why would they all right <clears throat> cool um britain their first really widespread use of free trade i, I forgot i forgot to mention this to great britain uh they're the first ones to really harness this whole free trade thing and they didn't even do it necessarily by choice. They had to do it because there was a severe incident where they really needed access to cheap goods to save a large portion of their population. Like the Hungry? Hunger what? The Hungry? With the I thought it was the Hunger Games. It's like, no, it's a book though. Uh, what? <laughs> the Hungry 40s. What was the Hungry 40s? You remember? Yeah, that's related to it, but tell me more about it. Okay, cool. So the 1840s also known as the Hungry Forties. Hungry Forties. There was a potato blight that came over from the Americas, wiped out uh, potato crops in uh, Northern Europe, especially in Ireland. They were super dependent on it, not only for food, but for their own you know, uh, profits. So with this potato blight, again, hit especially hard in Ireland, um, people were starving to death. Quite a few people were starving to death. Because again, they either lacked the food or they weren't making enough money off the potatoes. So they had to starve to death or leave. A lot of them left once the United States, so we had a huge influx of immigrants from Ireland in the 40s and 50s. Um, but to try to help out and pay for these British subjects, not pay for them, but allow them to buy grain cheaper so they don't die uh, as easily without these potatoes, Great Britain does something so that they can get cheap grain from Russia and the United States. They like the corn laws? Yep, corn not meaning like actual corn, that's just the word in, in England for like grain. So think of it like grain laws, but it, they call it the corn laws. Yeah, so uh, the first major free trade, excuse free trade uh, series was the uh, um, repeal of the corn laws. Which again, uh, the corn laws were just a uh, tariff on grains. So what if I wanted to buy grains from uh, Russia or the United States? Cost more or less with these corn laws in place. No. Oh, I both there. So the corn laws are tariffs on grain. Would grain cost more or less if the corn laws are in place? More. more. So what do I want to do? What's repeal mean? Remove. Remove, right. Get rid of them. So that's what this is. So by getting rid of the corn laws, so again, don't forget this, corn laws equal grain tariff. People were literally starving because grain was too expensive in Great Britain, so they wanted to allow uh, uh, cheap Russian and uh, American grain to enter the market uh, to save some of these people. So they repeal them, and then they get uh, uh, cheap U.S. Russian grain. Grain to aid with famine uh, starvation. Hopefully that makes sense. So corn laws, I should have put those beforehand. Corn laws are in place, and then they're removed in the 18, I think the 1846, maybe it's 45. Uh, they're removed, uh, again, specifically so they can have cheaper grain and people aren't dying. All right, is that free trade? Yes. It is, right? They got rid of the tariffs on it. Sweet. Uh, we got a couple more examples there. So there's three, really. Repeal the corn laws, Zulfurine, uh, Anglo-French trade agreement are all examples of laissez-faire free trade policies. Nice, and all we got now is two smaller topics. There was a group of people, not Marx and communism yet, there was a group of people that felt, believed 
the government should actually step in to protect the working class, make sure people got equal treatment, and uh, provide work for them. It doesn't work at all, but they have their, their heart's in the right place. Utopian yeah, utopian socialists. What does utopia mean? What? Yeah, like a perfect society of like no hunger or suffering, etc. So uh, they get the uh, uh, name utopian socialists kind of as a, a, a almost like giving it a negative connotation because it's like impossible. Uh, but yeah, so I have this idea called utopian socialism. Socialism meaning that the uh, government actually steps into the economy uh, to either determine it completely or you know, manage some parts of it. Uh, so we have a couple proponents, saint Simon and Charles Fouillet in France and Charles and Robert Owen in the United States and Great Britain. Fouillet, Robert Owen. These guys are all what you would call utopian socialists. So again, uh, they, would, they believed in things like if you were unemployed, the government would uh, start workhouses, kind of like the poor acts of, uh, in England, how you would like have a, a poor tax on the middle class and they would give money to the government and they would have them like do a bunch of menial tasks like digging holes and building things and whatnot. But nobody wanted to do it because it wasn't meaningful work. Um, I think, was it Fouillet or Simone? One of them uh, actually got to try this out in revolutionary France and it worked terribly, just like the poor laws did. Well, which one was it? Fouillet? Okay, Fouillet. Um, they actually tried this out in France, uh, just like they tried with the Poor Act in Great Britain. It's not successful for number one, because it's not meaningful work, which is what people need. Uh, and also, people have no incentive if uh, uh, you're taking a large amount of money from them and, 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 and paying for work for other people. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have a safety net, which we'll talk about in the 20th century period for, very much necessary, but um, this is a step in the right direction. It just doesn't quite work out. Uh, one of these guys is kind of successful on his own, though. He's actually a factory owner. Uh, what does he do? He, um, like, makes the pay better, so he increases the wages. And then he has housing benefits for the workers. Yeah, exactly. So he's a factory owner. And instead of, like, trying to squeeze every penny out of his factory make at the expense of the workers, he intentionally raises their wages, makes their living standards better, cuts their hours a bit. Uh, so he basically has better workers, ha happier workers, I should say. Um, and he's still productive and profitable. So he actually demonstrates that you can be a little more benevolent uh, as a factory owner and you'll actually get a lot of productivity and appreciation from your employees. Uh, but he does try his own, what you call a, um, uh, damn it, I'm forgetting all these names right now. When they try to start a little utopian town, I forget what it's called, but he basically tries to start his own little utopian settlement in the United States, and it fails miserably. Um, just like all these experiments have, where everyone shares everything together, then just unfortunately, that's not how human, humans work. Uh, no one's incentivized to do anything, and so very little happens. People get angered at each other, and, and they either leave or it gets violent. It doesn't end well. Uh, so a failed social experiment, but they do actually bring up a great point. The working class is being screwed over uh, at a rate that is not sustainable. Like, they're not going to continue to be uh, abused and misused in this way. So there needs to be some form of um, um, reform coming to, to, uh, to amend that. So before we get to Marx and radical uh, Marxism and throwing away the entire system and starting from scratch on the belief that humans are naturally benevolent, benevolent and want to work together, which we kind of do, but that's not the only motives we have, um, there's a uh, much more practical approach that is used by classical liberals. Um, that's the approach we're going to talk more about next week. I'm just going to kind of summarize it now. The idea, John Stuart Mill, who you probably have heard the name of from AP World, he had the idea that if you allow equal opportunity and voter rights, even for women, he was a really early advocate of female suffrage, that if the working class could vote, how could things get better? Voting on better laws. Yeah, they would vote in for better laws for themselves. Are they by themselves, though? Would they just be able to pass laws for themselves and screw over the middle class completely? No, no they wouldn't. Uh, what it does is it takes away this middle class like grip on uh, government policies, and it forces them to coexist and compromise and argue and settle uh, with the working class. Uh, so he argues correctly that uh, opening it up to um, everybody, so having working class people vote, run for office, or just vote for people that support them, 
that's going to put people in Parliament or Congress that uh, try to have working class reforms, and they can't just pass them all. Uh, they'll have to compromise and settle with the middle class who also can't just pass whatever the laws they want because they have to compromise and settle. So the idea here is get everybody involved and then they'll have to debate and argue and try different things and some things will work and that's great and some things won't work and they'll pull them out. out. But it's like gradual little reforms throughout time uh, and it actually turns out to be a really good uh, formula. So uh, we'll talk more about next week but we'll just basically summarize it as classical liberalism reforms. We'll get more specific next week with Stuart Mill and utilitarian uh, beliefs, but basically it's just universal suffrage, suffrage, suffrage meaning voting rights. So people vote for laws. And so what are some examples of laws that they did vote in across the 19th century uh, that were actually helpful for the working class, that were, were compromises? The Mines Act. Yep, the Mines Act and the Factory Act in the uh, 30s and 40s. So those made child labor illegal, for example. Um, uh, illegal in mines and up to a certain age in factories, that was wonderful. The ten, hours. ten Hours Act, right? So they capped the, uh, uh, the required work day at ten hours. So if you had to work beyond that, you had to be paid extra. Oh, factory Act? Factory Act, oh, we got that one. Yes, yeah, so that's basically just child labor and child labor limitations in factories and mines, which is much safer for the kids and everybody else in it. What else? New conservatives legalized um, strikes and unions? Yes, we'll get to that next week, I think next week. Uh, but we also have a new type of conservative called the New Conservative. So they're conservative in that they like are still advocates of monarchy and nobility, but they realize they can't ignore this working class. So to prevent themselves from being violently overthrown, especially after Marx throws out those revolutionary ideas, they decide it'd be better if we just gave them some things so they didn't want to overthrow us and kill us violently. Uh, so guys like Bismarck, Napoleon III, uh, Count Cavour, who we'll talk about later, they're going to give the working class some reforms, even though it doesn't seem like they like the working class. So they're not middle class people. They're not working class people. They're old monarchists and uh, pro-nobility uh, uh, people or pro-church people that say, well, we're going to get violently overthrown unless we give these people something. So they give them some reforms to keep the working class happy enough not to overthrow them. So a couple examples of that are going to be uh, uh, workers insurance, or I'll say accident insurance, probably more accurate, injury insurance. So they either provide through the state or re require companies to uh, pay for any damages to yourself at the factory. And also, uh, that's in the 1880s, they also legalize unions. They do that in France and strikes in the 1850s. And lastly, they have uh, pension retirements. That's also in the 1880s. Anybody know what a pension is? You're all paying into one right now if you have a job. It's um, money you pay to the government. Yeah, or, or to a, a private industry, but the, the concept's the same. So it's not just I'm giving money to the government. What's, what's happening? Because a pension's a specific thing. It's like money pulled together. Um, it's part of your paycheck. Um, that they take out and it's all put together until you reach a certain age when you retire, then once you retire, you can basically just live off that. Yeah, uh, well, hopefully. But yes, it, it, it's income after you can't work anymore. So it could be government required, which is what Social Security is. You all pay in as you work across your lifetime to this big pile of money. And then when you retire, uh, you're going to be collecting from it. And who's funneling money into this big pool that you're being collecting money from when you retire? the people who are currently working. So like right now, let's say you have a job right now, or, or me right now, I'm putting money into social security and also teachers' pensions, and I'm that money's going to retired teachers and other people that have already contributed across their lifetime. Now they're done, I pay into it, they get my money. And then later on, when I'm in my 60s or 50s and retire, then I'm gonna get money from them. So that's what a pension is. So it's like this big floating invisible thing of money that you work your entire life from your 20s to your 60s, you pay into it, and then after your 60s, you collect from it. And of course, the new generation of workers are the ones piling into this pension. All right, so there's state pensions that you have to pay into, like Social Security, but your individual employers, or if you're an entrepreneur, uh, you're paying into a private industry that's doing the same thing. And they're usually investing it too in the stock market if it's a private industry, so it could be more, but. Uh, more detail needed to know. Pack it up.